All right, everybody, welcome back. Once again, you're listening to the Entrepreneurial Web. I'm your host, Jeremiah Fox, zooming in live. I'm making it a verb. We zoomed, we zoom in. Now, my restaurant, Della in Brooklyn. My guest today, Aaron Felder, the CEO of the Food Trust based out of Philadelphia. He also used to live in the neighborhood. So we both deal in food, but Aaron got his start in another uh, branch of uh, nonprofit service. And as soon as we get him back here uh, on the video. I'm here, I'm here, can you hear me? He's here, he can yeah. talk about that. And my apologies again, every week is like, we're discovering something new. Last yeah. week, we lost like the first 20 minutes of video. Uh, you know, the, the, all this technology and stuff I'm not used to. I My lapel mic, it was just sitting on the table that whole first <laughs> segment. And I looked down like halfway through and I was like, shit, <laughs> I might need that. <laughs> so... <laughs> <clears throat> that wasn't a cough. That was a cough. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Um, apologies, everyone. Nice Dracula <laughs> cough, though, Jeremiah. For the, right. <laughs> well, the uh, professors made me do that before. He made me fart out of my mouth once. <laughs> uh, the, the inept audio, hopefully it'll be better this time. But every week I'm learning something new. So why don't you tell everybody, you know, you mentioned you had been in uh, nonprofits for over 20 years, but the food trust is something newer for you. What were you doing prior to this? So immediately prior to this, I was the chief operating officer at a comprehensive um, health care and social services agency in the Bronx called VIP, which stands for Vocational Instruction Project. It's been around since 1974, which is exactly how long I've been around for. Oh, um, you old. No, I'm <laughs> That's why you always beat me up on the mats, man. I have a few years on you. <laughs> just a couple. Just a couple. Um, anyway. So, so anyway, that. Um, that agency is primarily an addiction treatment services agency. So it had a, the first floor of it was a big um, methadone clinic with about 1500 patients a day. And then a lot of other clinical services um, throughout the building, like a federally qualified health center, which is a, essentially a comprehensive family health center, primarily for people on um, government health insurance products like Medicaid, Medicare. Um, day treatment programs, residential treatment, a homeless shelter, um, lots of other stuff I'm forgetting right now, but I was, Boy, I was, was in the, you was in the trenches. <laughs> I was, I was, I was. Yeah. And the, you know, it's the Bronx, which is, um, the opioid crisis is really hitting the Bronx really hard. It's really right. sad. It's really, really sad. Um, um, yeah. I heard another, something else just this week about, um, one of the reasons they decided to keep liquor stores open and alcohol, if they didn't suspend alcohol sales in New York City was because they were afraid the amount of alcoholics that went into withdrawal would start to flood hospitals and they didn't want to, they were already looking at being overwhelmed. How, how, is, uh, how is something like uh, heroin addiction and opiate addiction going to affect, in your prediction, what's happening right now? Because supply chains can't be so great right now for that <laughs> yeah i mean i've been thinking about that and i'm i'm totally disconnected from it professionally at this point so i don't know but my speculation is that those places have to stay open because they're keeping people alive right um and it's close quarters it just really is those waiting rooms are jam-packed the um, dispensing stations are all right next to each other so I th my guess is probably what they're doing is just taking extraordinary precautionary measures, probably wearing um, PPE, personal protective equipment, to the extent that it's even available anymore. Right. Um, it's tough here. It's tough yeah. here. Yeah. I mean, if you take a, a hospital like Beth Israel that has a methadone clinic in it, how are, you know, how do they, because there's always, you know, people pouring out of that hospital in that corner my wife works right there um you know it's that's a that's a rough that's a rough little corner but that's also a hospital so they're they're servicing people as well i'm curious how they're handling a situation like that where they've got patients you know regular patients that are coming in and out of there with with opium addiction related uh issues and then they've got They've got a, a crisis on their hands. And they've got a health center. Um, and a lot of these places are co-located. And that was a big push right. kind of nationally to, to have services all, all under one roof so that people could go get their 
methadone, but then also to go, you know, see their primary care provider. And right. now I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if that's still viewed as a blessing or not. I, I don't know. Yeah. That's gotta um, be tough. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm sorry. Go ahead. Jim. No, no, no. It's a, uh, um, talking about you, you mentioned something about the food supply chain in the first segment. I think that's been something really top of mind for people. They've been concerned about accessibility to food and toilet paper obviously <laughs> i made a vow that i i will reference the toilet paper scarcity as many times as possible in every show until, you're doing very well so far until shelves are stocked at the deli at john's deli right now you can only buy two two packs of toilet paper at a time there's like a it's it's, it's like allocated the same way like pappy van winkle reserve bourbons are <laughs> like you can only you can only get one at a time and they're super expensive well at the grocery store about five minutes from my house they seem i'm not gonna say a name just in case they they seem to have either food or paper towels they don't seem to have both ever at the same can't have time both yeah yeah you know it's a, it's a tough, it's, you, it, you need so paper just, towels it, when you cook, you need food to cook, you know. <laughs> it necessitates multiple trips, but that's okay because right now that's really the only time I'm leaving my house. Right, right. <laughs> right. Although there's, there's a lovely path around a reservoir here called Cooper River Park. It's about three and a half mm -hmm. miles. So um, on the rare occasion that we've had sunshine, I've gone and kind of walked and run it. So. Nice. That's been nice. And it's nice to just see other people and smile at them from Absolutely. six feet or, or, or further, you know. You know, Prospect Park has been packed. I can't even go in there anymore because um, there's just too many people and too many people congregating in small spots, you know. So I've, I've found some other, you know, we, we've got a bunch of cool little nooks and crannies around this neighborhood. So I found some other interesting spots to do like my outdoor workout and get some fresh air. Um, but like we can't take the kids to the park anymore. I mean, nope. right now. Fortunately, we have the backyard at Della and that's, you know, it's fenced off and nobody else has been back there in a long time. So I've just been, you know, they're back there right now, <laughs> you know, just getting some fresh air. But yeah, too many, just too many people around. But the streets have definitely where we're at. I, I'm, I don't know. There's some spots where I think that it's it's a little too dense. But around here, everybody's starting, you know, I'd say since Sunday, people really started to heed kind of uh, the distancing uh recommendations but prior to that i mean friday in windsor terrace it was you know 70 something degrees it looked like mardi gras there were just you know and now you can serve drinks to go so everybody had you know plastic to go cups from here from the <laughs> paddock from the bar just walk on up and down the street there were kids roller skating and skateboarding and stuff and i was like I, i'm not sure this qualifies as proper distancing but then I don't know, it seemed like sunday kind of everything snapped in and and i think when the governor said you know everything non-essential will close 8 p.m sunday night people kind of got it but people were still getting their hair done and getting tattoos and like piercings and stuff like that and yeah so um, here here in cherry hill in new jersey <laughs> it's been the same situation and the only way that you can get food that you don't make yourself is um curbside and has to be previously ordered and everything is dark there's no bookstores up i mean everything right right, right. Uh, liquor, liquor stores are still open here too so so um, public health officials recognize the danger but of, in pennsylvania uh, i heard they were closed is that true uh i don't know i don't know but it it, it possibly is because they're state regulated there right. and those those are all um government employees who work um in those stores so yeah they might be closed and there might be people driving over the uh over the border to New Jersey to get to get to stock up to get some Coronas. <laughs> yeah, to get the Coronas, right. Um, but but you know, what's been interesting since people have really started taking the distancing seriously is the ways that we're using technology like Zoom to to bridge the gap. Um, one of the first things that I did after after I closed the agency, uh, the, the office was to start an 8 a.m. Uh, daily meeting with my management team just to look at what was happening with the situation, mm -hmm. talk about our programs and all that kind of stuff. And in the beginning, which feels like a year ago, but it was just last Monday. <laughs> like eight days ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, crazy. The conversation was rapid fire and there was always new stuff to react to. Um, 
now things are, are kind of settling in. Um, and so strategies, protocols are becoming more permanent. Mm -hmm. And so those meetings have become a little stagnant. So um, we're, we're injecting a little life into them. We're making them more personal. One thing is using video technology. Mm -hmm. So important to see people's faces when yeah. you're just on the phone. It is that deadly. Sucks. Yeah. 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 No, definitely. Yeah. Like, like, you know, I run the meeting, so I'll say, does everybody agree with that? And when it's just on the phone, it's just crickets on the other end. Right. <laughs> so I, they, I, they've muted you and they're like this motherfucker. <laughs> I've, I've taken silence to, to equal consent. Um, <laughs> just in conference calls. That's because you're uh, a father. <laughs> <laughs> that I am. Right um yeah. and hi lucy and emma if you're watching i don't know if you are but you might be zooming into school right now um, right <laughs> multiple zooms anyway, dad kids are savvy these days i know i know well they, they, what's amazed me just to 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 pivot a little is how prepared new york city has seemed for this hey you um, think <laughs> yeah i do i do i really do i mean i know there have been some hiccups but to roll out a system like this to, um, I mean, I don't know how many public school kids there are in New York, a million plus. A, a mil over a million, yeah. Yeah, and so that's the size of Philadelphia. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, I mean, it, Philadelphia, I think, is is not doing it because of equity issues, because not everybody has this, um, access to the necessary technology. But I know that um, New York City is, and I think that's really commendable. And they must have had a plan in place before this. I mean, I think there were some schools, you know, my wife's in education and uh, and, and I've got two school age daughters and, uh, you know, it seems obvious that some schools were already on board with something like this and exercising it to an extent. But I don't think I don't think my wife's school was. And I think there's a lot of schools that weren't. At, but the, the pressure was just so great. Um, and it's funny, it was like the kids <laughs> were like totally ready to do it. You know, they they just set everything up so quickly, and and where adults are like, I don't know how to work this. <laughs> like a, a nine year old was like, Oh, you just hit this button, and you know, because it's just they're used, they're growing up in a very technological uh, era where where we didn't, and there are things that are just indigenous to them that aren't to us, <laughs> you know. Um, but uh, it's funny, I've seen it kind of from the back lines where my wife is trying to get a school online, and then watching two other different public schools trying to get the kids online. So I've seen it from both sides and uh, it was definitely a, a big Hail Mary. But like you said, you know, you stretch the importance of strategy right now. And I think everybody that's still trying to operate, I know from, from, from me here at Della and at the wine store, we've had to adjust so many things and just on the fly. And this is definitely not a time for, <laughs> for thin skinned people, you know, um, it, it's a it's a high pressure situation on so many fronts. It's it's you know attacking your potential health and well being. It's attacking your finances. It's attacking you know just the future of fucking society in a way. And it's it's super high pressure. And that, you know you'll see a lot of people just fold because they're not they weren't prepared for this uh, in on on a number of different ways. Like we weren't prepared technologically for a lot of things that are happening, but. We're just using our intuition and, and previous experience. And it's literally drawn on every job and experience I've ever had. Like the last 10 days have just like sucked it all out of me where I was like, oh my God, I haven't utilized this skill in 25 years, but I'm really glad I had that job 25 years ago that gave me that information, you know, and it's just been sitting dormant <laughs> in the subconscious work mind for all this time. And it just, it just got like sucked well, out. It's, in the last it's amazing minutes. how quickly you can access it again, right? Oof. Like one of the, one of the ways that I was, have been able to keep relatively calm and kind of keep things going along with my management team. They're all great. My board who are also all great. Um, was what I learned during Sandy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of people are citing that a lot of New Yorkers right now are citing their experience with Sandy and even people uh, talking about 9-11 and how that's helping them cope with this particular scenario, because even though the face of the obstacle is different, the response is often the same. 
Well, I mean, dur- so during Sandy, the major difference was that basic infrastructure was knocked out, right? So, like, yeah. you couldn't have teleconferences if your server room was underwater, which, which right. it was for a lot of places. Right. Um, but at the time, I was running a network of about 15 um, health centers that were lo- uh, located in homeless shelters throughout the city. And what we would do is not that different from what we're doing at the Food Trust now, which is where the yeah. management team would get on a phone call every morning. We'd look at what's what, redeploy staff, figure out what we could do, what we couldn't do, and just kind of manage throughout the day. And it sort of feel it felt like like it feels like now, like it's a yeah. like it's a command center almost. Like we're we're all meeting each other all day, dealing with everything as it as it comes up, trying to keep the cash flowing. Um, right. so the parallels are really interesting, even though sort of the faces of the disasters yeah. or the crises are, are completely different. And it's almost know? every day in a restaurant. <laughs> yeah. Right. I'm sure. I'm sure. It's All so right, we're going to take another break, Aaron. We'll be back in just a few, everyone. You're listening to the entrepreneurial web. <laughs> 